for once, it's been a relatively quiet week, which is some relief uh, in these troubled times. I'm Andrew Hilton, and I've now been offering my thoughts on the global economic outlook for exactly one year since March the 23rd, to be exact. So what did I say then? Uh, well, first of all, I said that there was little that monetary policy could do to get us out of the crisis that we were uh, collapsing into and that the focus would therefore have to be on fiscal policy. And I guess that still holds. Second, I said that when we come out of the uh, crisis, the global economy would look very different. In particular, I said that the public sector would have expanded enormously and that the private sector, which is where jobs in general are created and innovation starts, would have been devastated. I think that's broadly true, though. I guess I miss the private sector winners like Amazon and Netflix and Deliveroo. As for the virus itself, my view then as now uh, was that it's only really serious for the elderly and for those with pre-existing health conditions, and that in the end, and I quote, a lot of people will rebel against the economic cost of lockdown. After all, I said, quote, we are not China. Well, maybe I underestimated the West's capacity for masochism, or maybe it's just that my timing was off. Um, I note, for instance, the uh, demo on Clapham Common last week and in Bristol over the weekend, and it does seem as though we in the UK have reached the limit of our public tolerance for home confinement. Um, on the whole, though, I do think that what I said holds up reasonably well. And if you don't believe me, you can see the video on our archive. So that was then. This, however, is now. What's new? Well, I think central banks spoke last week and the message that they gave was pretty clear. Whatever the risk that inflation will be, burst through the 2% target that most of them aim for, this is not the time to push interest rates higher or to roll back quantitative easing or to end bond buying programs. That's as true in Europe and the UK as it is in the US. And it's true in Japan as well, where the Bank of Japan uh, released a review of monetary policy on Friday that emphasized just how damn difficult it is to break a cycle of deflation. So no change on the monetary policy front. Coupled with an expansionary fiscal policy, that suggests that the official line is still to goose the global economy sufficiently that it comes out of the COVID tunnel like a rocket, regardless of the impact on inflation. The rationale for that is the same as it has been for a couple of months now, jobs. In the US, the Fed chairman, Jay Powell, uh, re-emphasized last week that nine and a half million jobs have, and I quote, gone missing as a result of, of COVID. Hence, um, here, the figure is closer to 2 million, 1 or 2 million, somewhere between that, but it is still significant as it is in the European Union. As far as Powell and Janet Yellen and their peers on this side of the Atlantic are concerned, that is worth taking a risk uh, for in terms of inflation, particularly since there is as yet very, very little sign that prices are actually rising, except in one or two countries, notably Germany. But of course, any short-term economic forecasts are almost entirely dependent these days on how quickly we can put the COVID panic behind us. And that depends on how effective the vaccines are and how fast they can be rolled out. After all, to reach herd immunity, this nirvana, we need at least 70% of the population to have either been inoculated or to have been infected. And of course, it needs a population to have confidence that the end of the crisis is coming and that we won't be banged up again because of a sudden increase in infection rates. At the moment, 
the US appears to be racing back to normality, notwithstanding local and regional spikes, with Biden's promise that all over 50s will be vaccinated in the next month or so. Discipline now appears to be breaking down, and I think it'll be very difficult for state or federal authorities to enforce any new major lockdown. Here, I'm less certain, but the Clapham and Clapham Common and Bristol demonstrations do show that younger people have finally got the message that they are not really at risk. That said, I know reports over the weekend from some mid-level bureaucrat at Public Health England or whatever it's called these days, that we will all have to wear masks and socially distance, and I quote, for years to come. My view is essentially unchanged. We will have to learn to live with COVID as we have learned to live with other viruses. There will be surges. There will be third, fourth, and fifth waves as there are with other infectious diseases. But in the end, we will have to accept that the only way to handle this problem is to handle it as we've handled other problems, vaccination and a stiff upper lip. Okay. The economy. Well, there was an interesting Bank of America survey of global risks last week, which I think uh, is interesting because for the first time in a year, COVID was knocked off the top spot by inflation and by fear of an unexpected capital, uh, central bank tightening as the result of an, what they call an unruly rise in borrowing costs. I think that's significant. The markets clearly are not entirely convinced that the monetary authorities will be able to hold down interest rates as they promised if price pressures really do build up. So I think this tension is well illustrated in the markets these days. Last week, for instance, global equity markets were clearly hearing and believing central bank promises of easy money until the crack of doom, as well as counting the ka-ching, ka-ching, as treasuries are pumping money into the economy in the UK, for instance, uh, to the tune of £19.1 billion pounds, uh, last month alone. True, the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, did end down 0.5% for the week, uh, despite a record close on, on Wednesday. It sold off on Thursday and Friday, but that is still up 6.6% year to date and believe it or not, 72% year on year. Same with the broader S&P 500. It closed down 0.8% for the week, but it was up 4.2% year to date and 70% year on year. Closer to home, the FTSE 100 was down 0.8% for the week, but was up 3.8% year to date and 29% year on year. As for Jan Germany's DAX, that was up, up for the week 0.8%, despite a sharp fall on Friday, and up 6.6% uh, year to date and 64% year on year. Wow. Also, it's worth noting that that means that those who hold or held financial assets, which means older, by and large, older and richer folk tend to have done rather well out of the pandemic, vindicating my fear a year ago that the, uh, the COVID virus would exacerbate both income and wealth disparities. Bond markets, however, are looking a bit shaky, particularly in the US. Over the last two weeks, the yield on the 10-year US Treasury benchmark has risen from 1.57% to 1.73, while the long bond yield has gone up from 2.3% to 2.45%. Those are big moves. European bonds have been much less affected with the 10-year the German Bund yield rising only from minus 0.31 to minus 0.29, and the 10-year UK gilt yield only up from 0.82% to 0.85 over the last two weeks. But pressures are building. The gilt yield, for instance, hit 0.89% on Wednesday before recovering a bit at the end of the week. Well, I suppose the answer to 
to that conundrum as to why US rates are rising faster than European rates is that the European economy is perceived to be lagging the US. And I'm sure that's true, even though economic releases in the US last week were, shall we say, mixed at best. Certainly, there was some good news, both the Philadelphia Fed's manufacturing index and the Empire State, that is the New York manufacturing index, were up sharply this month. And the conference board's index of leading economic indicators rose again in February, albeit only by 0.2%. But it was also reported that... uh, U.S. retail sales fell 3% in February, that industrial production was down 2.2%, with capacity utilization falling to only 73.8%, which is quite low, that housing starts were down 10.3% in January, and that house prices in the U.S. actually fell in March. On top of that, it was reported that initial jobless claims increased again in the latest week, though uh, that was probably more a function of the winter storms in Texas than of any fundamental change. Even so, the Fed, whose FOMC, the Federal Federal Open Markets Committee, held a two-day meeting last week, has upped its economic forecast for this year. It's now projecting that US GDP growth will be wait for it, 6.5%, up from a previous forecast of just 4.2%. And some Wall Street companies, Wall Street analysts, are now predicting 8% growth this year. The Fed is also saying that core inflation will hit 2.2% by year end, which is significant, and that the unemployment rate will be down from around 6.1% to 4.5% by the end of the year. Though, As I've said before, Chairman Powell clearly shares Yellen's view that this is a highly suspect figure and that real uh, unemployment is significantly higher. Now, I've been sceptical about the US economy's ability to bounce back post-COVID, just as I've been sceptical about our ability to bounce back over here. However, I guess I never expected the kind of fiscal boost that Trump and Biden have jointly pushed through, and it is joint. The current consensus is that Americans are about to go on a spending binge, the likes of which we haven't seen for a generation, thanks to the stimulus checks that families are already receiving. Well, maybe half of that, it is said, will go into equities, holding the, uh, well, at least stopping the, the bubble bursting. But the expectation is also that there'll be a boom in spending on all the things that Americans have been deprived of for the last year. We will see. I remain a bit cautious. Yes, um, the savings rate in, in the US and elsewhere has gone through the roof, but people's perceptions of job security have also changed. And I'm not at all convinced that uh, most middle Americans are really confident enough about the future yet to uh, blow the egg money on a spending binge. As for Europe, well, even though the consensus, which, which I have to say I share, is that it is lagging the US in terms of recovery from lockdown, most economic releases last week were actually quite strong, indeed significantly better than expected. At the Eurozone level, for instance, it was reported that ZEW's um, Economic Sentiment Index improved this month from uh, 69.6 to 74, which is a big jump. In Germany, the Sentiment Index also improved sharply, while the Current Conditions Index was also stronger. Of course, however, it wasn't all good news car registrations in the Eurozone, for instance, were down 19.3% in February. But the general picture was more encouraging than the row over COVID might suggest. As for inflation, well, as I said, it's generally not an issue yet, except in Germany, where it was reported last week that wholesale prices were up 2.3% year on year in March. That's a precursor of consumer price inflation to come. Here in the UK, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee also met last week and left both interest rates and QE unchanged. 
despite a sharp improvement in GFK's uh, Consumer Confidence Index this month, and despite a record public sector net borrowing requirement in February, which is bound to put the gilts market under some pressure. Elsewhere, I've already noted the Bank of Japan's policy review, which in some sense was an admission of defeat. It's just proving a whole lot harder than anyone had expected to get the Japanese economy humming again. Though with a falling population, uh, per capita income is actually rising rather nicely. That, of course, means uh, poses an interesting question for all economists. Should we focus on GMP or GDP, or should we look at uh, per capita income? Or if Richard Layard and Diane Coyle, amongst others, are right, should we dump economic measures altogether in favor of happiness or, or some other non-economic measure of welfare? Well, that isn't really a problem, at least in China. Uh, and the Chinese haven't had to cope with it yet. For them, the focus is fixed firmly on the macroeconomy. And one has to admit that uh, things are looking pretty damn good. Of course, it's, all, it's not all good news. Uh, the urban unemployment rate in China, for instance, edged up uh, last month from 5.1% to 5.2%, if you believe the statistics. And that's, that's actually important because the Communist, Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy is closely tied up with its handling uh, of uh, the employment city situation in the cities. But otherwise, it was a pretty stellar week with industrial production up 35.1% year on year in January, February, which are always bundled together because of the Lunar New Year. Retail sales were also up 33.8% year on year. Home sales, we're up 38% by value and fixed asset investment, which is a good proxy for future growth, was up 35%. Pretty damn impressive, one would have to say. That might account for the distinctly uncompromising approach that China's top foreign policy duo, Yang Jiangji and Wang Yi, adopted last week when they met with US Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Anchorage, Alaska. They certainly weren't going to accept lectures from Washington on human rights from representatives of a country that in their eyes is now on the brink of some kind of racial revolution. So not much progress was made on trade issues, on sanctions, even on China's imports of Iranian oil, which are likely to be as much as one million barrels per day next month. That, of course, uh, raises what is perhaps an even more important issue, China's political clout. I note that two deeply experienced senior, senior US diplomats, Bob Blackwell, whom, whom I know pretty well, and Philip Zellico, published a report last week warning that China is on a sort of pre how can I say this, pre-preparatory war footing, and that if one looks at the signs, it could be preparing for military intervention over Taiwan. They are very careful not to predict that Beijing will invade. Still less are they willing to put a date to any invasion, but they argue that if China were getting ready to invade, it would be doing what it is currently doing in order to get all its ducks in a row. Scary stuff, that's going to pose a big problem for President Biden. It's also going to pose a problem for our own Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, whose government published a 114-page defense and security review last week that, among other things, treated China as a potential economic collaborator, while Russia is defined as an enemy, a distinction that, uh, in my opinion, may turn out to be 180 degrees wrong, and that also included a tilt in Britain's foreign policy, uh, away from Europe to the so-called Indo-Pak region, where China is the emerging hegemon and will not take kindly to an interloper. <laughs>
So problems in store, I fear. As uh, the Americans used to say, remember Quimoy and Matsu, though Quimoy is now, I think, in men. Uh, problems in store also, I think, in, in Europe. It's not just the fiasco over production and allocation of COVID vaccines, though that's a big issue, threatening to widen both north, south and east, west splits within the EU with, with the blame pretty much equally shared amongst Ursula von der Leyen, who is living up to her hard earned reputation for incompetence, and uh, Mrs Merkel herself, who apparently overruled her health minister when he tried to uh, cut a deal with France and the Netherlands that would have bypassed EU procurement. It's also uh, an issue in France where Macron is using his um, part Algerian interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, Darman, Darmanin as, a, as an attack dog to beat Marine Le Pen at her own anti-immigrant game. It's a dangerous strategy because if using Darmanin legitimizes Islamophobia, why not vote for the real thing rather than the ersatz version uh, peddled by the president? There's also a crisis, or rather perhaps another crisis brewing in Turkey, where Erdogan fired his third central bank governor, Naci Akbal, last week over his reluctance to follow the presidential line on interest rates. His replacement is one Sahap Kacioglu, uh, who apparently believes salvation for the Turkish economy requires rock bottom interest rates, regardless of the impact on the lira or on capital flows. It's going to be an interesting test, but I fear, as we used to say, that you shouldn't pick a fight with the bond market. In the US, well, Biden is still enjoying what amounts to a media honeymoon, though I'm more and more convinced, as I said last week, that he has essentially ceded control of policymaking, particularly in the economic area, to his key lieutenants, who, to be fair, are by and large pretty experienced, having hung around Washington think tanks uh, since the Obama regime or even the Clinton era. However, Biden too will face challenges. Leaving aside for now anyway, the problem of how to handle China, if it does step up the pressure on Taiwan, there are two big issues that he will have to face in the immediate future. The first is how to cope with the increasingly toxic atmosphere in Congress, where the left wing of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives is increasingly at odds with the party's geriatric leadership, and where the traditionally collegiate atmosphere in the Senate has collapsed, largely because of, the, of Chuck Schumer's abrasiveness. Uh, Biden himself may have poured gasoline on the fire last week by hinting that he would support the, an end to the so-called filibuster rule, uh, which prompted the minority leader, Mitch McConnell, to warn that if the Democrats did try to do this, he would use the Senate's so-called standing rules to bring congressional business to a halt, which he could do, though no one would win. The only outcome would be that both parties would uh, end up losing whatever little credibility they have, thereby vindicating the criticisms of US democracy made by Xi and by Putin over the last couple of weeks. The second challenge that uh, Biden faces is the 100,000 or so Central American migrants uh, who are now arriving at the, America, at the US border armed with what they seem to think is a personally signed invitation from President Biden to cross into the United States. This is a tricky one. His left wing supporters are indeed keen on open borders, but the American electorate, including Democratic voters, is not. He's tried to fudge the issue. Uh, with a uh, route to citizenship for those who are already in, those illegal migrants who are already in. But the real issue is what to do with those who want to come in. Uh, it's difficult. And it's an issue that Republicans will play hard in the 2022 midterms. What else? Well, you may have noticed that Saudi Arabia's 
uh, Aramco, Saudi Aramco's net income fell 44% in 2020 to only $49 billion. You will also have noticed perhaps that uh, despite this precipitous fall, Aramco paid out a promised $75 billion in dividends, admittedly more than 90% of which actually went to the Saudi government. I don't really know what that means, except I guess that it does suggest that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is keen to keep foreign capital coming in, regardless of the ups and downs of energy markets. Mm. That said, oil prices are in a bit of a trough at the moment with uh, front month Brent which is one of the two, two key marker crudes, currently trading at around $64.40 a barrel off 7% week on week. Texas Intermediate, the American marker at 61.30. Still, if prices hold at these levels, I think Aramco is looking at a much, much better 2021. But will they? Last week, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, published its latest five-year oil market forecast, and it made somewhat uncomfortable reading for the industry, if not for climate activists. Uh, the key points were, first, that global oil demand is now not expected to recover to pre-COVID levels until 2023, and beyond that, that it will probably finally peak at about 104 million barrels a day in 2026, uh, though gasoline demand, petrol, petrol demand may already have peaked, having fallen 2.9 million barrels a day in 2019. Uh, second, that the there is currently about 9.3 million barrels a day uh, that could be brought on stream very quickly if the in the event of an unexpected pickup in demand. And third, that any growth in oil demand is likely to come from the emerging markets rather than from the advanced economies themselves. I've been wrong before, but all of that would seem to suggest that oil prices are at or close to their peak, even though some of those who are some of those economists, serious economists who are most bullish on global growth, are also predicting that oil prices will hit $100 a barrel before the end of this year. As for this year, uh, as, as for this week, well, I guess that uh, we in the UK will learn how we're going to pay for Boris Johnson's new nuclear and cyber aspirations and for his own Asian tilt. Uh, betting is that cuts in army manpower will be part of the mix, even if uh, that will further undermine relations with the United States. In the EU, well, there's an important council meeting this week with the Commission's failures in the COVID area, pretty but close to top of the agenda. Ursula von der Leyen will get a rollicking, but nothing more. Um, I sincerely hope that the council doesn't opt for vaccine nationalism, not just because it might stop me getting my second jab, but there is certainly a head of steam behind exports to block, uh, behind efforts to block exports of the AstraZeneca cut drug, regardless of the damage that that would do elsewhere. Well, Israel is holding its fourth election in five years tomorrow. Cynics expect a fifth before the end of the year, and they may well be right. You can never count Bibi Netanyahu out. As for economic releases, well, the most significant in the US will probably be the PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditure data for February. In Europe, the focus will be on, I think, on Germany, where GFK's Consumer Confidence Index for April will be published along with the IFO, the IFO survey for March. In China, the PBOC is set to meet and may finally announce a tightening of monetary policy, which was sort of rub it in for the rest of us. China may have been, indeed was, responsible for the COVID outbreak in the first place, but it has beaten it in record quick time, much to the West's discomfiture. On that relatively happy note, may I thank you for listening and for watching, and I hope to see you again next week. Many thanks.